Hi, my name is Kara. This is my husband, Paul. And we're here to um, learn more about um, different strategies for parenting, especially parenting teenagers. Um, I feel like we're in a different um, stage with our kids, and we'd like to have a little bit of advice and some tips. I wanted to spend time on the relationship with my kids. I wasn't really interested in discipline strategies. I, I did not I did not want to learn how to count, time out, chart, like bleh. I'm lazy, it's too much trouble, it's just like, no, I don't want it. But I did want a good relationship with my kids. Here's why this is important. Because if you have a good relationship with a three-year-old and a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, you know what they do? They cooperate with you. Because the truth is, when you yell at kids and you punish kids and you bribe kids and you scold kids and you humiliate kids to try and get them to do what you want, they don't like you. And when they don't like you, they don't cooperate with you. And when they don't cooperate, we start looking for more strategies to try and get them to do that. The relationship I have with my kids becomes their blueprint for every other relationship they will ever have with every other person on the planet. Nobody tells you that as a parent. That every time I say something my child, they gather that information, they bring it inside, and they go, wow, I wonder when I get to be that age if I can talk to somebody else who's smaller than me in that tone of voice. I wonder if I have to listen to orders from somebody who says that they're taller and stronger and bigger and smarter. I wonder if there's a way to get around this person who's trying to bully me, boss me, sass me, and tell me what to do. So when we listen to kids, we have to empty the mind. It's not just a matter of like, uh-huh, are you done? Are you done? It's my turn yet? It has to be as if you, you have, like, so that there's space for them to dive down a little bit deeper. Here's the other thing I know about teenagers. They throw out little testers to see what you're going to do. So when they come home and say, I hate my math teacher, what do you normally say? <laughs> you are so good at math. The math teacher loves you. And they're done. They're like, uh -huh, okay, good. There we go. You're not interested in what's happening for me. You want this to be okay. So you're going to move me out of my experience so that you can take credit for getting me through one more thing. And we miss what's really going on. We have to learn how to listen differently. We have to shift our mindset and say, in order to build a strong relationship with teenagers, we have to stop having all the answers and act like the stupid ones in the room. Stop showing off for your kids. We all know you're smart. Go call a friend if you need to tout how smart and wise and wonderful. But this is your kid's time to start figuring things out. And if you want to establish that relationship, you've got to sit like you've got nothing else to do but listen and ask a curious question. And that means that you have to suspend judgment. The second thing is, um, when people were talking about discipline strategies with little kids, I wasn't interested. But when I really started to think about this whole thing with, and maybe none of you did it here, but your sister-in-law did, counted, timeouts, naughty chairs, magic one, two, three. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of stickers. I'll give you this if you don't do it. If you don't do that, I'm going to take that. But when they talk about a discipline strategy, they don't mean discipline. They mean compliance. They, they arm us with all of these strategies so we can control our children and get them to comply. Well, I, that's great if I'm in the room with them. But what happens when my kid leaves my house and enters the world and there's nobody there giving them the hairy eyeball? because they don't have any skills, except how to be scared, how to not get caught, how to avoid getting into trouble, or how to just suck it up and, and take it. I didn't want that. Because I knew from the time my kids were five and they were out in the world, they were gonna have to use self-discipline, self-control, and self-regulation in order to stay alive. So I decided that's what I would be teaching. I'd be teaching all those character traits that I knew would ensure that my kids would make informed decisions, informed choices. So our kids are so at risk because they don't have that internal foundation of self-discipline control and regulation because we wanted compliance. So we have these perfectly behaved kids, well, sometimes if the bribe was big enough, and we could put them on display out in public. Third thing is independence. Now, when you have little kids, 
you want to get them independent for the biggest reason is because we know that self-control is based, I mean self-esteem is based on two things in little kids. The ability to take care of yourself in totality and your ability to contribute to the group you're a part. Self-esteem in little children is built on two things. I can take care of myself and I can help my family. But this is what we do with little kids the minute they're up and they have two hands to help. What do we say to a kid who wants to help? It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too high, it's too sharp, you're too messy, it takes too long. I'll do it, I know just how I want it. You talk a kid out. We train these kids for a couple of years that we're all behind their independence. And the minute they're up and they've got two hands, we shut them down, we're like, you're done. Independence is over for you. You're messy, you're sloppy, you slow me down, you don't pick out the right clothes. I want you to have long curly hair, you're trying to chop it off with the scissors. You're done, your life is mine. The kid's like, no, it's not. <laughs> you might think it is, but it's not. Until they get to be nine or 10 and you've had it. And you're tired of being the maid, and you're tired of being the chauffeur, and you're tired of being the cook, and you start saying to the kids, you have to be responsible for yourself. You are old enough. The kid's like, are you out of your mind? You have spent nine years convincing me I'm a moron, and now you want me to just step up to the plate and take it on. Not happening. There's a whole project now, the happiness project, which is total crap. <laughs> because if you've lived on the planet for more than about 45 seconds, you already know that for every happy moment, there's a sucky moment. There's a really down in the gutter, sad, lousy, I don't want to do this anymore moment. But we're not, we're not supposed to have kids who do that anymore. We're only supposed to have kids who are happy all the time, which is impossible. So what is a kid who feels bad inside <coughs> supposed to do with that feeling when mom and dad have said, I don't want to talk about that? I want you to be happy, so what do we have to do to make you happy? And you learn very quickly as a little kid that your parents don't want to hear it. So you stop talking about it. And you put on a fake happy face, which is why so many parents say, I didn't even know she was depressed. Because she's always smiling. She has so many friends, which doesn't have anything to do with anxiety, stress, depression, or the slide down into thinking, when your kids talk to you, when they have an emotion, when teenagers are emotional, your job is to hold the space. You don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to tell them that it will pass. You don't have to make it better. Your job is just to say, you are really whatever it is. And then to be quiet so they can keep going down, and down, and down until they get to the end and then they usually fall apart, they're in your arms, and they're hugging, and it's still not your job to try and make it better. Your job is to ask, so what do you want to do now? Think beyond this moment with your kid. Don't get stuck in this moment. This moment, you, you, if you've got a 13-year-old, you already know you don't remember anything about five, but five was so important when they were five, like, oh my god, then, then it's like, uh, they made it through kindergarten. I think we did something okay. This too shall pass. 13 will not last forever. So you have to be thinking, what are you doing today that is going to influence them as 24-year-olds? And stop thinking that this is the be-all, end-all. It's not. It's a walk through. So let them keep walking and stop trying to anchor them in this worst possible moment or, or the worst possible situation and think, how is this going to serve my kid when they're 24? Where is the lesson here? And then ask your kids questions so they can begin to develop self-awareness. It's not important that you know your children. It's important that your children know themselves. And we do not ask them questions that get them to reflect on what they're doing, how they feel, how they go through the world, why they pick we're telling them what we think. And as soon as we start to talk, their brains go to sleep. Nothing is happening. Nobody is home. So we have to be thinking about, in this moment, what can I do that's going to prepare my child to be successful at 24? We have to stop acting like this science paper is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And this friendship, and this boyfriend, and that hooky, and that smell of booze, and that whatever it is, is the, it's a part of something bigger. So figure out who you're going to be in those moments.